a large part of seeing depends upon habit and convention. Now perspective centers everything on the eye of the beholder. It is like a, a beam from a lighthouse, only instead of light traveling outwards, appearances travel in. Perspective makes the eye the center of the visible world. But the human eye can only be in one place at a time. It takes its visible world with it as it walks. With the invention of the camera, everything changed. We could see things which were not there in front of us. Appearances could travel across the world. Hi. There's a Mary inside of that airport. And I have a sign. In the 21st century, the ways in which we create and maintain friendships has been radically altered by internet technology. This is my friend Morel, who lives in Puerto Rico. We met in what might seem a fairly unconventional way, through YouTube. We make videos and post them online for each other and anyone else for that matter to watch. Our friendship is documented in over 300 videos from the past three years. We've only met once in person and although our friendship might seem unusual, there are many people around the world who forge important relationships through social media. Hello, my name is Mary McGillivray and in this film I'm going to be exploring my unlikely friendship with a girl on the other side of the planet and I'll ask what our relationship can tell us about the nature of intimacy and the internet. The big difference when he grows up, in fact, when he wanted to wait for the year 2001, is that he will have in his own house, not a computer as big as this, but at least a console to which he can talk to his friendly local computer and get all the information he needs for his everyday life, like his bank statements, his theater reservations, all the information you need in the course of living in a complex modern society. This will be in a compact form in his own house. He'll have a television screen like these here and a keyboard and he'll talk to the computer, get information from it, and he'll take it as much for granted as we take the telephone. I wonder though, what sort of a life would it be like in social terms? I mean, if our whole life is built around the computer, do we become a computer-dependent society and a computer-independent individuals? In some ways, but they'll also enrich our society because it'll make it possible for us to live really anywhere we like. This prediction made by author and futurist Arthur C. Clarke in 1974 is almost eerily accurate. But what I find most interesting is not the way that Clarke predicts computers helping with movie tickets and bank statements. It's the concern of the ABC reporter who asks what a digital revolution would mean for our social lives. Hello, Australian people. This is the greatest cat you will meet. I am Mirel from Puerto Rico. It's pretty trusty that I have this behind me because Puerto Rico is here. It's here and Mary is over here. For a generation who grew up with stranger danger and cyber safety drilled into us from a really young age, it may seem unusual that young people are finding more and more ways to connect with people from across the globe, people that we've never met before in real life, using digital media and the internet. But with over 3 billion internet users crossing paths every day on social media and forums and blogs, how do you start a meaningful relationship with someone in this sea of information and exchange? In my experience, online friendships are just as circumstantial and random as real life friendships. Just as you might make a friend in a bookshop or waiting in line for a coffee, it was almost pure chance that my Puerto Rican friend Morel and I met in the way that we did. I saw you across a room, the room that is the internet. I clicked a button and I followed you and then you followed me back and you were my first ever subscriber in YouTube and that was so that, that was so important to me. Despite the many chance meetings you might have online, forging meaningful friendships on the internet has to be very deliberate. In the internet room, social conventions are different to real life. You can be in the same room, if you like, as someone else, and there's no obligation to talk or interact in any way. Because there's no such thing as small talk online, every interaction that you do make has a purpose. You have to be like, you, I like you, we should be friends. And then that's sort of weird, because you don't go up to a person in, in real life and go like, hey, I want to be your friend. Almost a year ago, to the day actually, yeah. I got fired from 
in my first ever job. The company was closing down, so I got fired. And I immediately got home to film a video for Mary because I wanted to share that experience with her because as you would call a friend on the phone and be like, I got fired wrongfully, and then shed all of your tears over the phone, I couldn't do that with Mary. So I sat down on my desk to film this video in which I spent a full 15 minutes basically speaking through my sobs. <laughs> After that, I decided against posting it because I thought it was a bit too personal not to share with you, but to share with the entirety of our audience, which consists right now of about 50 people, 52 people. One of the main challenges of having a YouTube friendship is deciding what information is appropriate or safe to disclose online and what's best left to private communication. We try to omit as many personal thoughts as we can while still trying to maintain a very personal relationship. Norella and I started video blogging to each other in 2013 when we were both 17 years old. Being underage and still in high school, we had very strict self-enforced rules about what information we would allow in our videos. I was careful about my last name, the number plate of my car, where I lived. I mean, now I'm, I'm more like I've said it before, I live in San Juan and I don't think I've ever mentioned where I went to high school. I was also very careful about where I worked and you can probably figure out where I go to university, but I still don't specifically say it. Over the past year or so, Morella and I have become a lot more relaxed about what information information we put online, but that doesn't mean we're not aware of the dangers of putting yourself out there on YouTube. As an adult 20 year old, I don't feel as worried about the information I give off on the internet. As a female 20 year old though, I do feel a bit more worried. Mainly because um, I believe that if you're a female, you may get more uh, strongly worded messages, mainly due to your looks. Sexual harassment on YouTube is a whole other topic, but it's worth noting that YouTube, like the rest of the internet, isn't some haven of social equality separate from the real world. The values of its users are reflections of society's values, and unfortunately sometimes those values promote casual sexism or, at worst, sexual assault both on and offline. this like window that we have right here is precisely that a window into my life and you can't see the mess that I have in my room right now you only get to see what's inside this little square and what I what I want to show you I am an eye a mechanical eye I the machine show your world the way only I can see it freed from the boundaries of time and space I coordinate any and all points of the universe wherever I want them to be my way leads towards the creation of a fresh perception of the world. Thus I explain, in a new way, the world unknown to you. Morella and I are quite aware that what we get to see of each other and what we get to see of each other's lives is selected and edited for publication on YouTube. But what repercussions does this self-edited presentation have on our friendship? When you know you're on camera, you act differently because you're aware of being watched by someone else. When I was 17, I didn't used to like dress up for videos and I just, my hair was weird and I just wore hoodies all the time. But then now I want to look presentable because to me now, this is a business platform. Whereas when I was 17, it was something I did to express myself creatively. The versions we show of ourselves in our videos may have become more constructed over time as we've gotten older and more conscious of our presentation online. For example, about 18 months ago, I uploaded a very personal and emotional video about the death of my grandmother. It's only recently that I've realized that much of my imagination and love for creating things. I learned that from her. Morel, my grandmother, passed away last Thursday. <laughs> and I'm gonna miss her. This video is very hard for me to watch even now, but I see it as a great example of the way that internet friendships can be intimate and can be very meaningful. But would I feel comfortable posting this video today? Maybe? Maybe not, it's hard to say. The knowledge that we're being watched, that we have an audience, makes us edit ourselves and perhaps limits our communication on YouTube. With you, I can actually look back to the specific moment we met and the specific experiences we share. It's more documented and I feel it's less nostalgic because I can just, you know, 
see it. The highly visual relationship that YouTube facilitates has also really helped us understand more about each other's cultures and identities. Having a window into someone else's life, especially when that person lives on the other side of the planet, gives a unique insight into a way of living that may be at the same time very similar and very different to your own. I had a very specific idea of what Australia looked like, mainly due to um, like cro Crocodile Dundee and all, all of those things. Good day, I'm gonna throw a shrimp, shrimp on the barbie. Looking at you and listening to you, I get to imagine you even more complexly than I would if we were only through text. I get to, to see the, the people who surround you, I get to see your cat, and I get to see where you live, and I get to see the, the weather, and there was one video where you showed me around um was it melbourne i can now be like yes it's melbourne not melbourne i got to see what it looked like i was like that looks so european and you sound mildly british like, in the way that i'm not like a stereotypical puerto rican I'm, I'm like one definition what it's like to be puerto rican you're one definition of what it's like to be australian and i get to see that simply because of the fact that we have a very visual relationship an academic called clement chao wrote a paper on what he calls the participatory culture of youtube chao outlines five points which characterize this culture relatively low barriers for artistic expression and civic engagement, strong support for creating and sharing one's projects, informal mentorship, a belief that contributions matter, and a sense of social connection. For me, number five is the most important because the social connections that YouTube facilitates is what drives people to participate in YouTube culture. So on one hand, we can see how YouTube as a platform makes people want to connect and maintain friendships. But on the other hand, I know from personal experience that it can be hard to keep up a friendship which consists only of making videos for each other. YouTube is useful as a social network only in so far as it can direct people to relationships and communications off of the platform. Have you ever heard of a friendship that existed just on YouTube? We move to Tumblr and Facebook and email and Twitter and Snapchat, etc. YouTube connects, but it doesn't sustain. That was a YouTuber called Anthony D'Angelo who makes a lot of videos about YouTube culture and sociality. And I think he makes a very important point. Other forms of social media such as Facebook and Instagram are not only much easier to use as there isn't the hours of work put into making a video, but are also way more integrated into our lives. And it's these platforms which really help sustain a long distance friendship. If we ever stop using YouTube as a platform, it's gonna be Dif difficult like keeping up with friendships if we were not in other social media keeping up a friendship with somebody you don't have access to over the internet is very hard if they live far away now i can just be like what's mary up to i i stalk your instagram and and heart everything <laughs> if, if we weren't on other social media i would feel more inclined to make more videos because that is the only way i would have access to you this also links back to the privacy concerns of choosing what to disclose online to a public audience and what's best left to a private Facebook message. There's also that desire for an immediate back and forth conversation that YouTube just can't provide, as well as a need for an easy way to share short pieces of news without going to the hassle of making a whole video. When people think of vloggers, they don't usually think of people like me and Morel. They think of the really popular YouTubers like Jenna Marbles, Shane Dawson, Charlie McDonnell, Dan Howell, Natalie Tran, etc. Some of these people make a living from video blogging and have millions of subscribers. Some vloggers have become celebrities. So what does that mean for the rest of us? When I first started making videos on YouTube, I was actively looking for a group of young vloggers from all over the world. I did find some uh, kids who were roughly my age. You were one of those people. And you were basically the only friendship of those to work out. Because I was uh, attentive of all of these, you know, all of these channels who had tons of people who became friends by, you know, making videos to each other. I've always felt a bit sad that I was not able to achieve that. Mostly because I believe that the window for that closed when people started to become brands in YouTube. Around 2005 to 2010, there was a real golden age of community building on YouTube. This was a time when the line between creator and consumer was still very blurred. Since then, arguably because of the increased sponsorship and monetization of YouTube content, the YouTube celebrity was born. This meant that instead of a group of creators communicating on the same platform, two distinct groups emerged, creators 
and fans of creators. This doesn't mean, however, that people aren't still building small communities and making relationships on YouTube. Morel and I aren't alone. But for those of us who don't have many viewers, or sell any merchandise, or make any money off our videos, are we somehow more authentic than the YouTube celebrity? I have always considered you to be my main or only audience. So I've always done this as a conversation with you, which I believe has kept me more authentic. When I was having bad days, I will be like, hey, Mary, I'm going through a really rough time and I would go to explain so I would try to make to keep myself as genuine and as truthful as I could in that aspect I believe that our interaction is genuine I can't say for other people's though In July last year, I had the most amazing experience of visiting Puerto Rico and meeting Morel in person for the first time. For me, this was the most important part of our cultural exchange as I got to experience her life firsthand. Before you came here, this was the only interaction you had with my culture, and you're mainly the only interaction right now that I've had with Australian culture. So I, I sort of have you as a norm, and you had me yeah. as a norm. Whereas that is very interesting because I pass for white, I'm white passing, and I'm middle class. So you have this distinctive view of like what being Puerto Rican is from my perspective, which is not necessarily the best or most enriching um, experience. When you came here, you were able to meet on a range of different people, from my friends to people on the street, people you interacted with in shops and restaurants. You ate my food. Well, not food I made, food my mom made, or food I always eat. So what effect did meeting and spending time together in person have on our friendship? I've definitely been able to understand her culture and worldview a lot better from having seen it firsthand, and I do think that we're closer after sharing that experience. But what's really interesting is not whether something has changed in our relationship after meeting in real life, but the fact that we wanted to meet. Because for Morel and I, videos and Facebook messages and Skype calls aren't enough. We want to spend time together in person, face to face, showing each other our lives not through a camera but through shared experiences. All those things that we take for granted with our offline friendships are really precious to Morel and me because of the 16,000 kilometers of Pacific Ocean that separate us. We use the tools that we have to the best of our ability to do the things that offline friends get to do with each other. We confide in each other, we talk about politics, we dance, we sing, we celebrate birthdays, and we try to comfort each other when we're down. But all these things haven't stopped us from wanting to fly halfway across the globe to see each other, and I don't think they ever will. Thanks for watching, and thank you to Morel for three years of friendship. Done. Thank you so much for helping with this. It was so fun. I look forward to watching it. <laughs> All right. Bye, Mary. Bye. Good job. <laughs> <laughs>